Here with us now, former Republican congressman from the state of Texas, former presidential campaign candidate Ron Paul. He's out with a new book, The School Revolution, A New Answer for Our Broken Education System. Harold Ford and Brian Shackman back at the table as well. Congressman, it's always good to see you. Thank you. We're nice talking about here. life on the outside. You retired and got busier, it sounds like. <laughs> yeah, people say, have you really retired? And uh, I don't think that's a good term. I, I can say that I've retired from Congress. Right. <laughs> I've left Congress. You're, you're still working hard. Uh, we want to get to your book in just a second. Second, but obviously, given um, given your position on the Fed over the years, I want to ask you about the front page news in almost every newspaper this right. morning. Fed stays on easy money course. Quantitative easing continues. What's your take? Well, I'm not surprised, but uh, the markets were certainly surprised yesterday. But I think it's a, a, a major admission by Bernanke that things aren't good. You know, the fact that he's doing this and all the markets anticipated, well, maybe the economy has improved. He's literally saying, we're in bad shape. And yet the markets didn't interpret it that way because the markets are reflecting just that easy money going in the stocks, but it doesn't help those 99% or at least the large middle class and the poor won't help them one bit. They're still going to have trouble getting jobs. But uh, so there's a lot of disconnect here. But I think it was a very, very bad ex uh, you know, announcement yesterday that the economy is a lot worse off. And I think in time it'll prove to be the case. But aren't we in a situation where if the Fed cut this stimulus money, we might be worse off? Well, it can't get worse. I mean, to, to continue to destroy a currency is always bad, always bad. It always destroys the middle class and the wealthy get wealthier. And this is the prediction of Austrian economics for, you know, 100 years. And this is exactly what we're witnessing, those predictions that the wealthy get wealthier and the poor get poorer and the middle class gets wiped out. So, no, all inflation is bad. Uh, this idea that the Fed can create money out of thin air to satisfy special interests and the politicians who like to spend money, it, it always leads to trouble, except on the surface, a lot of people feel good about it. During the bubble phase, a lot of middle class people felt good about it. They were buying houses. And uh, house prices were going up until the inevitable bust came, uh, the wealthy got bailed out, and the uh, average person lost a job and lost their house. So it's never good, even if you feel good for a while. Right now, only the rich are feeling good, and the poor aren't doing well, and the middle class is getting much poorer. What's the most important thing that can be done in the short term to help raise middle class incomes, to raise incomes across the board? And what's the most important thing long term, government, business, combination? <laughs> can be done. The short time, the short term is really very tough. You know, if, if you wanted to say on the short term, if you wanted to intervene and had to intervene, you should have given the money to the poor people and let them pay for their mortgages and don't bail out the rich, which I wouldn't have advised. But on the short term, you could have done that. Long term is the only thing you can do is you have to decide uh, whether you want uh, a few men, uh, maybe women involved in secretly deciding what the interest rates should be. The interest rate, if, if people don't understand how important the interest rate is, they can't solve this problem for the middle class or anybody. You have to have savings, you have to have interest rates, that's the message to the business community. But we don't have interest rates other than what is dictated, you know, by, by a few people. And they're always wrong. You know, they're always wrong and they always will mislead. And that's why even yesterday is more misleading us uh, on what's really happening. So, you know, that artificial manipulation of rates, and we know your opinion about the Federal Reserve, but if you could pull, pull the levers right now, because you can't just go cold turkey, right? I mean, specifically, how would you get to the point where you could adjust it to more, a more normal assessment yeah. of what the rates Well, see, be. the cold turkey argument has merit to it because it would be tough. It would be a real shock to the short but system. But the alternative something. is a calamity like the bankruptcy of a whole country, like a city can go bankrupt, like we see, you know, like a Detroit. So when you're not really comparing, you know, an easing down and a smooth transition uh, or having a really tough thing to cut back. So there is no easy. There's no political answer. It's addiction. The people are addicted to spending. The politicians are addicted. The markets are addicted. And there's no chance that they're going to wean us off. And this is what Bernanke was saying yesterday. And the politicians aren't going to balance a budget next year. As a matter of fact, what we have been taught for nearly 100 years is that's stupid to balance a budget. Because what you want to do is you want people to spend money and borrow money and print money. That's the thing that we have been taught they don't for really a long, long time. They don't really believe we can go bankrupt. 
No one really believes it in the there. populace that we can actually go bankrupt. So it's a reality they don't actually assess when they're looking at the economy because absolutely they don't believe right. it can happen. You're but absolutely right, and that's why we're naive. And we've had we've had the blessing of being able to issue the reserve currency of the world. So they're still taking our money. But if that were true, none of us would ever have to work again. We would just have the Fed, you know, print money, and we would buy stuff from overseas. But that that confidence in the dollar, the confidence in our foreign policy now is starting to shake a bit. And they, they go together. If we if they lose confidence in our foreign policy, lose confidence in our economy, and lose confidence in our dollars, you will see interest rates rising, and then that'll be the big issue because that will be the most significant expenditure, and nobody will have any control of it uh, because the if you have interest rates doubling or something, uh, you, you can't legislate that down. Long term, for us to innovate, to come to your book, um, how do we how do we repair an education system that can educate and prepare the next generation of leaders and job creators and innovators in the country? S slowly. <laughs> and that that is the approach. Uh, the, the goal that I have there is to offer an, offer an alternative to sort of what we're talking about because we've been taught for so long a, a school of thought on economics and personal liberty and the importance of the individual versus, you know, uh, everybody coming together and managing. I want people to be able to homeschool their children. Not everybody. This is designed to pick out the leaders who want to, uh, and uh, m maybe 20 percent might be interested in doing this. But they would at least see these would be leaders who then would be talking about running for Congress and, and understand why the Federal Reserve is a problem. Today, we have been conditioned in all our schools that it's good to have a very, very robust foreign policy to be involved in all these countries. We've been taught that the Federal Reserve is sacred, except for the last five years, people are questioning the Federal Reserve. We have been taught that deficits are good and spending is good and borrowing is no what's problem. The correlation but we have to reverse that. And we what, have to what's the correlation between homeschooling and getting a better understanding of the Fed? I mean, that's well, the whole a thing is, 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 is for me. My whole curriculum and everything I talk about is based on the freedom philosophy, which is what I've been talking about for 30 years. But so the education would be quite different. It would be something where uh, young people would learn at their own pace. They would pick and uh, they would do it over the Internet. It wouldn't cost as much. But they're going to be taught different economics. They would have a different perspective on uh, on history. For instance, every one of us has been taught that one of our greatest presidents was Woodrow Wilson. But if you're liberal or conservative, if you look at Woodrow Wilson, he, he, was, he violently abused our civil liberties. He was the one that told us that we had to march around the world. He was the one that changed our foreign policy. And, and, and uh, I'd like to show that uh, some of our presidents, the only great presidents have been the warmongers. And maybe the people who argued for negotiations might be a better president. So it'll be a different approach. But it'll be upfront. It'll be the freedom philosophy. It'll be based on individual freedom and not a collectivist approach that, uh, that the federal government runs everything down. Now we're coming up with a core curriculum and just more mandates and more controls. And how do you satisfy people who don't like the textbooks? You know, there's no way you can solve that problem other than the fact offer people other choices. If you, if you want to get 20% of children being homeschooled, that's going to mean a vast drop in the number of women in the workforce because it is largely women who are do, doing yeah. the homeschooling. A lot of women can't afford to give up their jobs to homeschool their children. A lot of families can't afford that. And do we actually want to be encouraging women not to take part in the workforce because we know how valuable yeah, yeah. that diversity is? I, I'm just I'm concerned about advocating homeschooling on this level when women are having such a hard time already staying in the workforce. Of course, those are the problems created by what I'm trying to correct because they have to be in the workforce and they have to work and not take care of kids because of the system that we have because it's survival for them. To. So you you are you are absolutely right. It, there there is a choice. Matter of fact, my wife and I are talking about this even if the conditions would have been bad in our public school system when we were raising our kids, we probably wouldn't have homeschooled, you know, for various reasons. So it's not going to be for everybody. It's not like you're closing down the schools and everybody's going to be homeschooled. There's going to be uh, choices to be made and some some people will go out of their way for their children. And uh, But I agree with you. It is not
not going to be easy because we're facing the consequences. I saw an article yesterday of a woman working two jobs and she was living in a shelter and she couldn't pay her bills because her cost of living goes up much faster than wages. That's another characteristic of, the, of this monetary system. So that is a consequence why they have to work. But uh, if, if, uh, if people really want to get it done, uh, they, they can. But I grant you, it will not be easy. But to continue to do what we're doing now, Harold, remember when uh, Washington ever had trouble with their schools, they always thought if we just gave them more money, it would solve it. But the schools that get the most money aren't the best, uh, best schools at all. Money does not solve this problem. And homeschooling, the kids are really learning, they're excelling, they're getting in college when they're 15 and 16. The costs are less, but there is something you have to invest in, and that is the parents have to decide whether they're going to do it or not. Before I let you go, Congressman, quickly, Nicole Wallace was out here in our last hour touting your son as a presidential candidate. We had a poll out of New Hampshire, a little early, granted, but he, <laughs> he's doing well. Um, what conversations have you had with him about running for president? Essentially none, actually. <laughs> really? <laughs> yeah, when, uh, you know, when they started talking about the campaign last fall, I said, isn't it a little early? I'm still trying to get all my votes counted. <laughs> do, you think, do you think, though, it's something he aspires to? Oh, I, I would think so. I mean, he wouldn't be doing what he's doing. But I haven't had a conversation with him, what's your plan, you know. Uh, he's been pretty independent. I don't know where he got this independence from. <laughs> so it was the same way for running with the Senate. He, it was something he had decided on. I guess my first personal reaction was, you know, that, that's a big job. But he had sort of uh, anticipated what the Tea Party movement was doing and was able to tap into that. So he surprised me how well he did there. So, uh, no, I think uh, if you look at where he's traveling and which states he's going to, uh, I would think it's on his mind. But actually, I haven't any, any personal conversations with him. But you think he'll run as a father's instinct? I, I would think that he's weighing it, and it depends on the circumstances. You know, sometimes in politics you can get beat up all of a sudden. You know? But no, I'm sure he's weighing it. I think he's doing a very good job. All right, Congressman Ron Paul, thank you very much. The book again, The School Revolution, A New Answer for Our Broken Education System. Good to see you. Thanks for having me. Coming up, Google's so. latest venture that could add years to your life.